As I was recording my second Japan lecture, I realized I'd forgotten to get updated times for the video segment that described the method for creating woodblock prints. Rather than scrap the recording and start over, which is what I probably should have done, I decide to kick off this essay review podcast with some more housekeeping. If you have time, watch the brief introductory segment to this excellent video. It makes somewhat different points than the art museum clip you just saw. But what I really want you to watch is a four-minute clip about the artist's production decisions, composition, and technique, and particularly the technique for making woodblock prints. The introductory segment that you may or may not have watched ends with the words, and it isn't even particularly Japanese. I find that statement more provocative than persuasive, but watch the second clip and come up with your own theories about what the narrator might mean. So here are a couple of possible answers. Even though Japan was still mostly closed to foreigners at this point, European art and European materials were entering through the port of Nagasaki where the Dutch were allowed to trade. The iconic blue of the Great Wave is Prussian blue. That was the first modern synthetic pigment invented in Germany in the 18th century. Moreover, Hakusai had clearly mastered the European technique of linear perspective. He would have seen some Dutch prints. As one art critic reports, in traditional Chinese and Japanese art, distant mountains would float sublimely in space. In Hakusai's series, 36 Views of Mount Fuji, which includes the Great Wave, the sacred volcano is seen in accurate perspective, Western style, small on the horizon, so it can give scale to the Great Wave. So the painting on the right is also from the series, and I thought it illustrated the point about linear perspective even better. You're going to learn more about linear perspective when we get to the Renaissance in January. But as the red lines that I rather ineptly inserted indicate, the contours of the front of the boat, the bow, direct our eye to a vanishing point just beyond the horizon of the painting. For this unit, and as part of your semester final, you will write your second long 30-minute essay. Note that the question opens with most of the identifiers. What's missing? Culture and materials. Here's the full College Board identification. The question continues and introduces the theme that will, and indeed must, organize your response. You are not going to simply dump everything you remember about this painting onto a piece of paper. Instead, you have to use what you've learned to place this painting into a broader context of an art history theme and of the culture in which it was made. And now comes the tricky part choosing the comparative work that you're going to write about. The college board list includes the Court of Gaiumars from Persia and the Marshall Islands navigation chart from our Pacific unit, but we're not giving you those options. Nor are we giving you a pick your own from column A or B option. Instead, you must write about one of the three East Asian works that the college board names. Here's one choice. Here is a second possible choice. Note that this is a Japanese Buddhist work from our Unit 4. And here is your third and final choice. Remember, you will only compare the Fan Quan landscape with one of these additional works. You get no points for talking about more than one, and you lose time that you won't have. You will not be able to use any notes on the test, and the essay will be handwritten. Computers closed. It's time to take off the training wheels. So just how many tasks are in this question? Don't be fooled by the numbers on the slide. The answer is there are seven tasks, or at least there are seven challenges in the rubric. The first task is to identify the other work, and you need to include two identifiers besides the title, which you've already been given. Put that answer first in a complete sentence and then leave a space before you address the next task, in order. Do not use bullet points, write in complete sentences, but make it very easy for your grader to see that you are answering every part of the question in order. So your second task, the second point in the rubric, is to describe the relationship between humans and the natural world in Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. Let's stop there and talk about this second task. 
So we're not comparing yet, and we do not have to distinguish yet between visual and contextual evidence. So what do you see, and why does the artist want you to see it? We talked about this back in my second China lecture. So, you saw this summary slide in your lecture, and it's included in your workbook as well, although I just now noticed that I left a letter out in the word qualities. Oops, it's now fixed. So, let me share a few other observations, and I'm drawing on the College Board scoring notes. Nature dominates this work. It's the subject of the work. Fan Quan uses a number of techniques to present nature as monumental and overwhelming. These include the massive scale of the mountain scale is a good art history word. There are multiple perspectives and differentiated brushwork that separate each of these three sections of the painting and again draw attention to the natural world. The humans, by contrast, are tiny and seemingly insignificant. A few other points. Mountains water and mist coexist harmoniously. This is a classic Chinese mountain water painting. It's a very important uh, Chinese artistic form. It presents a Taoist vision of a harmonious world in which humans essentially submit to overpowering nature. That is their place in the hierarchy. The noble pines and dominant central mountain also portray an ordered universe with each individual aware of his or her place in the hierarchy. Again, this is a Neo-Confucian vision. Do you have to say all that? No. And you don't want to use up too much of your 30 minutes on the second task. But most of you write too little rather than too much. Remember, you are not penalized for wrong answers. Write as much as you can while saving time for your other tasks. Let's move on to our third task. Remember, you're not comparing yet, you're describing, although the comparison probably leaps out and strikes you. And here's an important point. It's okay to repeat information between paragraphs. Again, you're not penalized for that. Write lots. So what relationship between humans and nature do you see in this work? Well, this one's pretty obvious. Chairman Mao dominates the painting, towering over his natural environment, which is basically just a background for his heroic stance. And what about this work? I think this is tougher, by the way, because the presence of humans is implied rather than portrayed. Clearly, nature rather than people dominates. The raked gravel and 15 rocks in the dry garden do, however, create a meditative place for monks to contemplate where they belong in nature. The monks also tend the space, so they both benefit from and care for nature. In other words, this is an interactive relationship with nature. So I'm hoping you have time to return to our video and watch a four minute clip that discusses the significance of Mount Fuji and the religious beliefs that this painting may reflect. So if you chose this work, what would you describe in your task three answer? Again, nature dominates this work. Note that only one of our three choices has humans dominating, although arguably humans also dominate the court of the Gaia Mars. Uh, the a Muslim choice. Because Hakusai employed linear perspective, the mountain is not huge, but it is still a dominating presence in this woodblock series. Above all, of course, the wave seems to be threatening to overwhelm and destroy the tiny people. There's a dispute about that, by the way, about whether, in fact, the, the fishermen are about to die. Watch the whole video and learn why. But nature doesn't just dominate in this work. It overwhelms, it attacks. It is not only a powerful force, but an aggressive force. Note, for example, the energy that the diagonal lines produce. Okay, this is where the question and the tasks get confusing. All those buts, all those ands. Trust me, plenty of our fellow art history teachers have complained about the complexity of these questions, but you're gonna run faster than the other deer, right? So here's how I would tackle this question. I would write a paragraph analyzing similarities. The rubric requires one. I would give at least two similarities, and I would support these similarities with both visual and contextual evidence as much as I could think of. Again, write plenty. And then I'd rinse and repeat, and this time I would address 
differences in another paragraph. Again, remembering to leave a space between paragraphs. If you have extra time, go back and add still more information. So let's use these two works as an example and start with similarities. Any thoughts? Do not be afraid to be obvious. These are both mountain water paintings, part of a long-standing Chinese artistic tradition. Both works are monumental. Both works have a central focus. In both, viewers enter the composition from a low foreground. Is that visual or contextual evidence? It's visual. It refers to what we see in the painting. The Fan Quan painting makes the mountains the center of the, of the painting, so nature and hierarchy rule over people. In the painting of Chairman Mao, Mao himself essentially replaces the mountain, but he's still ruling. Both paintings convey a political message about a centralized state. Is that visual or contextual evidence? It's contextual because it has to do with political situation in Fan Quan's China and in communist China. So, on the one hand, the artist of the 20th century work is trying to associate Mao with China's long and illustrious history. By the way, there's another similarity. Both convey journeys. Differences aren't tough either, so what's the most obvious? In Chairman Mao en route to Anwan, humans replace nature as the dominating force. Notice I've made this point in one form or another several times. Again, go ahead and be repetitive in your essay. The central mountain in Travelers Among Mountains is replaced by Mao, demonstrating a vast change in the scale of human subjects, or at least this larger-than-life human subject. Likewise, Travelers plays with perspective. While Chairman Mao employs a traditional European perspective, nature recedes into the background. Again, it's the human that's important. And that's a strong piece of visual evidence, but you want to describe the use of perspective. Don't just throw out the term, explain what it means. And while both paintings offer a political vision of hierarchy and a centralized state, there are some important contextual differences. Travelers is an idealized moment that's really outside of time. Chairman Mao purports to describe a real event. Remember, Fan Quan had retreated from ugly political realities at a very contentious time in Chinese history. He was describing an idealized hierarchy, not the political stability of the time because it was not a politically stable time. The artist of Chairman Mao, by contrast, embraces political conflict and clearly picks a side. It's Mao who will triumph. Human will is going to overcome. Well, I hope you don't all choose to write about Chairman Mao after I've given you his explanations. I actually think The Great Wave is a more interesting choice and arguably a more important work, but again, you get to choose. So after I graded your Unit 4 long essays on Buddhist architectural complexes, I sent out an email that made some general observations about what I saw in your essays and also included suggestions for improvement. Here are the main points I made. Take a few minutes to remind yourself of these strategies. And then run faster than the other deer. Good luck and Merry Christmas.